Welcome back to Seeker Strength. Welcome back to Seekistan. Today we're doing an SNC Coaches React to the South African rugby team, aka known as Springboks, looking at some of their in season training during the Rugby World Cup just gone, which they won. And this is an in season training session of the team. We've got a compilation of multiple different exercises, and we're just going to go through some of those and why they might be useful in the context of rugby. So we're starting off with some good old fashioned face pulls, which are a an absolute classic, I think. Very modest exercise. Yeah. I think most of the time you're looking at rugby teams training, or most of the time you get media footage of rugby teams training. It's in the lead up to a big competition or in the lead up to a big game. It's usually a week out or so. And for that reason, you see a lot of pretty low impact, pretty kind of high value exercises. So in cases like this, warming up the shoulders, making sure they're prepped for what's probably going to be another pitch session later on that day. Face pulls are absolutely perfect for that. We've got some banded overhead squats later on. And that's one thing to keep in mind all the time when you see these kind of large scale media videos of rugby players training. They're mostly doing priming sessions. You're very rarely seeing the big, heavy uh, strength and hypertrophy sessions or the very fast and powerful power sessions most of the time you're seeing quite moderate weights quite safe exercise selection and in this case those banded face pulls absolutely perfect targeting the upper back targeting the backs of the shoulders two areas that are obviously for the front row who's doing them going to be incredibly taxed during his rugby career so they're pretty much perfect yeah postural muscles and rugby are obviously incredibly useful for both resisting and dispensing out damage to other players. So face pulls, again, nice and modest, relatively low impact on the body. They target the appropriate muscles that you're looking for, rear delts, upper back, traps, etc. So very, very useful in a pretty low fatigue fashion, which is what they're going to be looking to throughout most of this session. Then we've got some in-session mobility, and we've got some of that mobility via stretching. And later on in the video, we'll see it as well from some banded or kind of band-assisted or use of a band in overhead squats in place of a barbell. So this is quite an interesting tactic, and it's something I think gets lost in a lot of field sports is while we'll often use mobility or stretching per se, or static stretching specifically as a form of warm-up, it's not often thought of as an effective tool to improve performance. Now, it could be easily forgotten that even though larger, stronger individuals like these are very, very uh, susceptible to getting tight or reducing range of motion via the large amount of impacts they get from their games, and this can very easily impact uh, mobility that they might have had before a particular game or over a couple of games where this range of motion is reduced. Now, it's very, very important when we're doing explosive sports like rugby in a lot of positions, you need your muscles and your tendon units to be as elastic as possible. The more elastic these are, the more power we can produce via the stretch shortening cycle, which we've talked about a lot recently. And mobility is one of several tools which, which we can do to use that. So static stretching, while it does seem to come under a little bit of barrage lately over the last couple of years with certain realms of people, uh, a lot of people will know that stretching is appropriate in certain cases and it can help temporarily in a reasonable fashion increase some range of motion. And if you keep it up enough consistently, we do seem to see both anecdotally and from studies, an increase in range of motion over a period of time. The major problem where this often comes in is that people assume if you stretch once and then you test again a week later, you've lost range of motion. Well, no shit. Like if I don't, if I don't keep running, I'm not going to keep my aerobic capacity. If I don't keep strength training, I'm going to lose a lot of my strength capacity. And it's the same with mobility and range of motion. Now, what method you use to increase range of motion depends on what you want to do. A lot of great people like Dr. Seth Performance, who we've had on the podcast, is a big fan of weighted movements through full range of motion, which we are also big fans of. Uh, static stretching in certain positions can be very appropriate and can work, despite what a lot of angry physios might say on the internet. And then the use of the banded overhead squats, very safe, easy tool. If you don't have a lot of range of motion, you can easily manipulate the band overhead to get into that squat and the squats we're seeing there are pretty solid for rugby players they're not very amazing. solid yeah very very uh very very a lot better than i would have thought <laughs> to be honest is just the, the way i would put that that's uh the advantage of using a band in that overhead squat so you see girth overhead squat in the back of this video <laughs> that's kits off. obviously not but the advantage of using a band there versus a barbell 
is when a barbell gets out in front of you, it's obviously pulling you forward a lot. It's putting a lot of pressure on the backs of the shoulders and you're going to limit the depth you actually sit to. When you have something like a band there that, as Gareth said, you can easily manipulate. You can also easily manipulate from side to side if you have some imbalances. You get much more range of motion, much better quality movement overall. Uh, one thing that pops up really regularly in these videos, you'll see the kind of strength movement or power movement and then some sort of static stretch almost supersetted in between or kind of semi-regulated in between where someone goes and they might be doing, like in this case, lunges. Then they're doing some sort of hip, like, a glute major stretch, pulling that knee across the, the chest as they're in their rest period in between. What you have to understand is, so a lot of people will hear this and be like, oh, that's not effective, that they're, they're limiting the, the elastic potential or the maximum uh, force output that that muscle unit's going to produce. Most of the time you're looking at that, you're looking at probably two or three minutes of rest following the stretch, which is definitely going to dissipate some of those negative effects. And almost always, it's going to be in a case where the exercise afterwards is non-maximal. So it's not the fastest sprint you're ever going to run. It's not the heaviest power clean you're going to do. In this case, it's not the heaviest overhead lunge you're going to do. And what you're actually doing is increasing the quality of that range of motion, probably increasing how good you feel for the session that's going to come up later in the day. Now, what we'll also see in a couple of different variations in this training session is a couple of different isolation exercises or strength movements. So we've got close grip barbell bench, we've got dumbbell bench, we've got some single arm kind of lap pull downs with resistance bands, which are a great exercise. And then we have a couple of other specific movements like that. All of them obviously are very, very light and relatively modest with that load because again in that in-season session they are just trying to maintain as much as they can without putting too much effort in so they're trying to balance the amount of effort they would need to maintain their peak off-season shape so the shape they came into at the start of the season is going to be the most physically robust they will have been in from up until that point or, or the in comparison to the in-season session it's a slow deterioration across the the length of the season as it is with most athletes and so what you're trying to do is to fight this deterioration or this decay of performance over the course of a season while not negatively impacting your on pitch performance and so what they're doing is they're looking to do as low impact low fatigue exercises that will help maintain or slow down that decay as much as possible now this can be done reasonably effectively it's a lot easier to slow down the decay of performance or maintain performance with a lot less work than it takes to maintain that peak performance or in comparison to even the amount of work it takes to improve so the weights they're going to be using are much lighter than they're capable of the movements they will use will be relatively very similar to what they probably would have done in the off season but it will be much less volume and much less in terms of absolute weight used. Yeah, rugby is one of those strange sports where somebody at the end of their off season will look like they're in much better shape and most of their metrics in terms of strength numbers, power numbers, and most of the time sprint numbers will be far better than they will be at the end of the season. They end up losing so many days in season every single year to injury or just a non-team selection or to travel at uh, around the world for games that most of the time at the end of a rugby season although you will have the most amount of time built up to specific training you will be in the worst shape for playing rugby you could possibly do most people limp towards the end of the season unfortunately rather than kind of continue to become more and more specifically fit for their particular sport if you look at a thrower if you look at a weightlifter if you look at a marathon runner all of these people will come into their in-season training with a certain level of sports-specific strength or fitness in any of these kind of seven or 12 different categories they're going to be training in. And then over the course of their actual season, they'll become much, much better at the sport. They'll have better metrics at the end than they will at the start. Rugby is one of these sports where that decay is something you're really working against all the time. Yeah, if you compare the weightlifter at the start of their season... Your sport specific activity is a max snatch, max clean and jerk. And the start of that is competition block you might be doing, your lifts, unless you're in a massive off season where you're on a drug holiday, your lifts are going to be lower than they will be by the time you kind of peak throughout that season. Season, Whereas we've compared them to rugby players, you'll come into the season physically robust, nice and fresh at that start. You might even see a little bit of improvement in on pitch performance within the first couple of sessions as you get back into it because realistically no amount of 
you know, non-specific aerobic work and conditioning will replicate the kind of demands of the game. You might see a little bit of improvement even in the first few games of the season, but then there is an ine- inevitable decay of performance uh, from the, you know, psychological demand, physiological demand of playing rugby. Now, we have a couple of other exercises we can see that are specific to core work. We have this uh, an interesting little kind of plank variation here, which is, of course, for any position in rugby, any amount of core work is very, very valuable. We have some weighted overhead sit-ups there. One of the more interesting exercises we see here is the use of a weighted vertical jump or just ignore any weighted jump. You see it being done with, with a hex bar. You see it being done with dumbbells. In this case, what's probably happening is these people are either going for a slightly lighter weight than a power clean would be feasible to do, or it might be a skill component. So you'd see some people are dumbbell benching, some people are straight bare benching. That's probably a skill component, probably to do with some previous shoulder injuries they may have had. In the case of the weighted jumps, though, we are probably looking at is some people being very proficient with a barbell. So maybe in their high school career or their uh, early academy careers they were coached well in the power clean power snatch hand clean all those things and then what you oftentimes get is people who might have had the same level of coaching they're obviously at the same level of being an elite international rugby player but in this case it's just easier to get them to do a weighted jump instead many of the effects you're going to get from a power clean are very very similar from the effects you'll get from the weighted jump but the level of skill you have to have with a barbell is much, much lower. So when you're looking at these sessions, you see some people doing different things. Usually it's either injury dictated, so we've lost a range of motion somewhere, or else it's a skill component. And the international level SNC coaches aren't really the people who do this kind of foundational work with them. The international coaches will have them for only a very short number of weeks every year, particularly in the run up to a World Cup. South Africa famously had the longest ever run up to a World Cup. Before Japan, they had the longest ever international rugby uh, pre-competition camp, which fared pretty well for them. Basically, yes. But, but they, most of the time, the international level SNC coaches are getting players from probably five to ten different teams and bringing them all up to the same level or bringing them to a level of fitness across certain variables that the higher level coaching staff have dictated. So they're really not doing any skill work here. They're not making any major changes. Most of what they're doing is just homogenizing the squad. Yeah, applying context to these situations is always so important. And, you know, you're trying to infer a lot from a video. And like Dara said, they might have come from a couple of different clubs who may or may not have had any coaches. They might have some international level SNC coaches. They might have amateur intern SNCs. They might be doing their own thing. They might not have paid attention to them. There's so many different variables that by the time they get to this in season session, the SNC coach in charge here has a lot to do with a lot of different adult athletes who he needs to work with and help them as much as possible, trying to assess what they're capable of doing while playing literally the most important games of their career for a lot of them or a repeat of the most important games of their career and injuring them or not injuring them is his number one goal <laughs> like that i was saying there on those way to jumps would it be better if they could all clean and jerk or clean 200 kilos or power clean 180 90 kilos absolutely that's going to be better than a 70 kilo trap bar jump but the difference in getting to 200 kilo clean and the benefits with aren't so much bigger the fact that some weighted jumps aren't going to get you a lot of the way there so like the benefits you'd get from a 200 kilo clean are definitely more than some weighted trap bar jumps but they are not big enough to justify the amount of work it would take for them to learn some very heavy cleans or heavy power cleans would it be great if the whole team could do that absolutely but that's just not realistic you know and it's very easy when we look at these videos to be like it's not that hard to teach people power cleans yeah if they are not in the middle of the World Cup season and you've got months and months to teach them. But in reality, it's just not feasible. You know, it's nice to think we of all people you would imagine would be the most for Olympic lifts or variations of for athletes. But most of the times we have to deal with reality. And the reality is it's just not applicable a lot of the time. It's just not possible. And if there's faster, safer, simpler ways of doing it, then that is the option you're going to have to take. It's a short career of rugby players. You're easily cut from the team. South African is very, very competitive. They are incredibly driven athletes, all of them. So it's just it's just a, 
as an S&C coach, you've got to do best by the athlete and not what you kind of perceive to be the most important thing to do. You've got to give them the best opportunity to play on the pitch. The last thing I'd like to say about this video, and obviously they're in a training camp here, they're probably not in like a national training centre, is that a lot of the time we get people talking in rugby, but in other sports as well, about quality of, of facilities, quality of investment or amount of financial investment and that having a direct outcome on the level of player you develop. In this case, they're training in a temporary setup, marquee tent. They have about two or three platforms, two or three squat racks and a good few benches. And they're the best rugby team in the world mm -hmm. and have been for quite some time. So most uh, colleges or, or university level gyms will be far, far better equipped than that. You really don't need fancy equipment. You see here, they're using very, very cheap Chinese bumper plates to the point where obviously their equipment provider has dictated that the the name be blocked out on those because they're, they're in this case, they're sponsored by Nike. You do not need fancy gear. You do not need massive training facilities. And in this case, they're developing the best rugby team in the world, objectively, with a something that's worse than a shed. Yeah, like... Could you argue that this could all be better? Absolutely, of course. They could be much more specific. But, you know, that's, you could argue that for everybody's training. You could go over everyone's training and look at how it could be so much better. But there's a lot to learn from this as well. You know, they've doing the most applicable stuff. There's nothing egregious here that I would look at and say that's absolutely terrible. You know, they're doing some a conditioning, some mobility, some very basic isometric work or isolation work, some weighted plyometrics. You could argue for or against the application of those. But in general, it's all pretty modest as it should be for in season. You know, nothing's going to really change here. Just keep them in shape, keep them moving, keep the soft tissue robust and moving through as much range of motion as possible. Keep them as resilient as you can for that in season games and then hope they make it to the end of that World Cup without, you know, absolutely crashing, which they did in good fashion. Um, like, would this make sense? Would these kind of sessions be useful in the off season? Are they going to make you into a machine for rugby no but that's not that's not what these are for you know so overall i thought it'd be a lot worse to be honest <laughs> i want not gonna lie i thought their their conditioning session would be a lot worse but yeah. we saw this no it's pretty good yeah. if you are a rugby player you're probably in either a pre-season period or a mid-season break at the moment so if you're either starting into your new season in the southern hemisphere or about to finish the latter half of your season in the northern hemisphere we have the seek of strength in season rugby program it's available on the app. The links are all down below. Also, something I'd highly recommend is watching the app breakdown video. It goes through the coaching logic and how those numbers change from week to week. It also goes through how you give your feedback and how that feedback is interpreted by the app. It goes through the smart coach bot feature and a number of other things like the video feedback myself and Owen will give you every week. Check it out. It's in the link below. We highly recommend it.